The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then will you stand outside, knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, We ate and drank in your company, and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where are you from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Last week, I watched the movie The Butler, which chronicles the life of a White House butler, Cecil Gaines, through eight presidencies and three decades, starting with Harry Truman and ending with Ronald Reagan. The movie is a snapshot into part of our nation's history. It was a time of historical change that swept through our American culture and politics, especially the civil rights movement and Vietnam. The civil rights movement exposed grave social and moral injustices. Today, we may deem many of those questions history, but they are not. They are the story of insiders and outsiders. The movie follows those changes and how they impacted Cecil Gaines and his family. And having been a young man at, during most of that time, I was reminded what a divisive time it was in our nation. Families and friendships were disrupted and even divided by racial and political issues that to this day still have remnants in our nation. There remain insiders and outsiders. It was a time of dramatic change that happened at great cost, not only in the streets of Birmingham and the rice paddies of Vietnam, but within the moral fabric of our own country, many of our own families, and even our own church. Part of the underlying question throughout the movie, not only for Cecil Gaines and his family, but for the presidents he worked for in the nation he served, was, where do I fit in? 
what is expected of me? In many ways, it was the same question that underlies the question put to Jesus in today's gospel. Will only a few be saved? Jesus, typically, does an I and run around the question. But he does warn those who see themselves as the chosen insiders of Israel that they may be cast out of the feast of the kingdom of God. Jesus does not dismiss, though, their chances because he has come, as we read in the prophet Isaiah, that Jesus would come to gather all the nations of different tongues. And we know that Jesus came to bring everyone into the kingdom. This was the primary message that Jesus gave, as it was of Martin Luther King and most recently Pope Francis. Jesus makes it clear for the Jews that it was not enough that they were descendants of Abraham and Sarah. It was not enough that they kept the law. And the message to us is the same, that mere externals and external compliance is not enough. It is not enough for us to be baptized or belong to the church or keep all the sacraments or have all the sacraments and keep all the commandments. We must go through Jesus Christ personally. We must personally go through the person of Jesus Christ. Pope Francis, in his encyclical Lumen Fidei, put it this way, Faith's new way of seeing things is in Christ. Faith in Christ brings salvation because in having him in our lives becomes radically open for us, the love that precedes us, a love that transforms us from within, acting in us and through us. Jesus says to some of his followers in this gospel that he doesn't know them because they do not know him. It wasn't just enough to be a follower and follow him around the countryside. One has to practice the discipline of being transformed by, in, and through Jesus. And so how do we do that discipline and practice. Well, if we look at Jesus' sayings and try to get into his head as to his understanding, we can find two clear points when he speaks about being saved, about being part of the kingdom of God. Basically requires the practice of right relationship with oneself with others, with all others, and therefore becoming in right relationship to God. Jesus focuses on self-awareness and becoming true to oneself. He does this with the Pharisees. He does it with his disciples, and he does it with sinners. He does it with everyone. Jesus emphasizes the point frequently that we are judged by what is inside us and not by the externals. This is reinforced in Hebrews today, which reminds us that self-awareness and intimacy with God demands discipline and self-control. Those are the narrow doors that we are called to get through. Those are the narrow doors that are necessary for all growth and all holiness. Discipline is not punishment. It means instruction or training for life. It is compared to the training a concerned parent gives their child, or the discipline needed for an athlete to become successful. 
one cannot become humble without disciplining the ego and practicing humility. One cannot become forgiving without disciplining our own sense of self-righteousness and practicing the art of forgiving. And while Jesus focuses on self-awareness, he points out that it is not just about my personal salvation. Self-awareness raises the question of what is expected of me. My salvation is intricately tied to yours and to the whole world's salvation. Karl Rahner wrote, the fundamental idea of Christianity is the divinization of the world. Now that's a big word, but it is the mandate of Jesus Christ to each one of us. To be saved is to be wholeheartedly participatory in bringing about the kingdom of God in all that we do. And what does it mean? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus exaggerates so as to caution us about not getting too smug, too complacent or too self-righteous, unable to see with the eyes of God. Many say the civil rights movement turned this, side, this country upside down but it really turned this country downside up. If we are living our faith, why do we even care who is first or who is last, who is inside or who is outside? Shouldn't we be striving so that there are no first or last, no insiders or outsiders? Because ultimately none of us are insiders or outsiders. We are the body of Christ, and as such, we are not asked. We are mandated by Jesus Christ to raise up the least among us. Jesus reminds us that in the eyes of God, there are no butlers and there are no presidents, just the children of God. <clears throat> 